I had to find my passion because mm-hmm. I just wasn't passionate about finance. Mm-hmm. If you go onto the high street and try to buy jewelry, it's a mm-hmm. cold experience. We put jewelry on the map. Meet Connie Nam, the founder of Astrid and Mew, a jewelry brand revolutionizing the jewelry experience. She's here to show you that pivoting your career is truly possible. I was so fascinated by investment banking and I had a couple of internships and I just loved how professional they were, how smart they were. When you're a first year, second year analyst, like, and you stay in five star hotels and you get to travel around, although you're like on your spreadsheet all the time. The whole vision and the inspiration behind Astrid and me was that buzzing, warm feeling. Do you think it's because jewelry was traditionally bought as a gift by men to women as opposed to women buying it for themselves? Traditionally, there were a lot of... How did you find the transition from entrepreneur to CEO? Very painful. (laughs) (laughs) So I would say the first... Hello, my fellow leaders. Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Borostovsky. I'm an executive headhunter, a career coach, and host of this podcast. Here we talk about how to find your calling, how to succeed in business, and how to live well whilst doing it. Episodes are out every Tuesday. As you may know, I'm taking Anatomy of a Leader live at a location in London. If you'd like to be the first to hear about it, then please do sign up for the waitlist, which is going to be linked in the show notes. And thank you so much for being patient with last week because we had a technical meltdown and didn't have an episode. It's really funny because I'm reading a book called Great by Choice by Jim Collins, who has also written a book called Good to Great. And it talks about the power of discipline and creating processes. So this is exactly what I'm working on right now to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen and that we continuously create this podcast for you. As you well know, the best thing you can do to support the show, to bring you these amazing guests is to follow and to subscribe. So please, please, please follow and subscribe because it makes a massive difference to us to be able to bring you all these amazing, fantastic guests. So this week... I sat down with Connie Nam, who is the founder of Astrid and Mew. I'm just going to shout out to these amazing earrings and necklace, um, which I have been stalking online after having the interview. Just amazing experience. But we'll get to that. I was really fascinated about her journey very early on in her career. She thought that getting into finance was going to be all the rage. Um, as She thought it was going to be glamorous. Only to later realize that checking Excel spreadsheets while flying business class wasn't really what it was all cracked up to be. So she then came up with her own jewelry concept, Astrid and Mew, and really put the sparkle into the shopping experience, which up to that point, which was now 12 years ago, was a very cold experience, predominantly designed for men buying jewelry for their loved ones. Connie talks to me about how she learned to be very adaptable at a very young age, doing her MBA, balancing motherhood and her work, and not paying to her gut instinct, especially when it comes to hiring her team. I really hope you enjoy this episode. So here she is, Connie Nam. Connie, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Well, thank you so much for having me, Maria. Wonderful to meet you. (laughs) Nice to meet you too. So learning about your background, you were born in Seoul. Mm Mm-hmm. And grew up in the US, ended up in London. So let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. Tell me about what it was like growing up for you. Growing up. So growing up, there, there's two parts, moving back and forth. So my dad was a diplomat. So I was born in Seoul. And the first time I moved to the US was when I was six years old. And then like we moved around every two to three years. So that's one part of my childhood. And then another part of my childhood is my parents fought a lot. So like that's another part. Um, right. that, that's a darker part. But moving around like had a lot of pros and cons. Um, you know, I learned to be adaptable. I learned two different languages, two different cultures. And it was very fluid because when you're a child, you know, like you don't know anything better. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was hard being a new kid every two, three years, having to make new friends. There were some days like in the initial like like first couple of weeks that I just have lunch by myself. So it was quite a lonely period. But I didn't think much of it because when you're young, you just get on with it, don't you? Yeah. And you're so adaptable. So I think like being adaptable and I think like I grew up to be, I guess, like more empathetic because I was like sometimes in that like observer seat being a new kid in school having to fit in and things like that I can totally sympathize with that so you know I was born in Russia we moved to the UK like 30 years ago so just being that outsider coming in and trying to kind of like read the room and assess Mm. what's going on and having to 
yeah, being able to adjust to what the situation. So yeah. as you said, it has its pros and cons. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. it's such a powerful strength to have as a leader. Um, you'd probably realize, right? Because mm-hmm. you see so many people, like the. I mean, like if they could solve self awareness or awareness like of their surroundings, they could just be a better person or a better leader. Mm, yeah, that ability to be able to yeah. not just put your own needs, but that of others, and to be able to understand that. Yeah, totally, completely. Um, so, when did you end up in London, and how did that happen? Yeah, so I ended up London fifteen years ago already. So wow. I came here for business school. Mm-hmm. Before that, um, rewind. I started my career in investment banking. Um, I worked in Seoul and then I worked in Hong Kong. Um, I was quite burnt out and I took a year out and then I came here for business school. Mm -hmm. And I vaguely like had this dream of working in fashion and or starting a business, but I didn't really have a concrete plan. But I came to London, went to London Business School, and that was kind of like a gap year for me. Mm. Yeah, like weirdly, I was in school, but like, you know, it was quite chilled. I made so many friends. I got to experience Europe, London, and it was such a wonderful time. Mm. Take me back a little bit. What drew you to finance? Why did you end up there? Yeah, good question. So I, I did my business studies. Like I always loved business. I was so intrigued by how advertisements were made. And my aunt would always tell me, oh, like, you know, in advertising rule in Korea, you're not allowed to say the brand name more than six times, like in an advert. And I just count those. And she'd be like, oh, you know, those cereal commercials, they actually put glue in milk and to make it really gloopy. And, and I was just so fascinated by, I guess, in particular, advertising and marketing. And I always loved business. So I decided to go into business. Um, on undergrad and at that time you know like all the smart kids were going into consulting or banking and it it just like I was so fascinated by investment banking and I had a couple of internships and I just loved like how professional they were how you know smart they were Mm -hmm. and I was kind of allured by I guess like the glamour yeah Um, although it's not as glamorous like once you no no (laughs) it's not as glamorous but you you know like when you're a first year second year analyst like entry level you get to fly business class sometimes first class you stay in five-star hotels and you get to travel around although you're like on your spreadsheet all the time so like initially it was really fun Mm -hmm. all of that and the, the learning was so steep as well because as like a 23 year old you get to speak to the CFO and CEO and who else has that kind of experience and exposure mm. I see the attraction of that because that's partly what attracted me to executive search so rather than recruitment is being able to operate at that very very high level mm. and having to speak to people who really make the major decisions and see how that all happens from from the inside so I totally relate to that so with regards to that glamorous so apart from traveling business and first class was it all that you imagined it to be I mean the first couple of years were amazing Mm -hmm. I had like really amazing smart colleagues who I still keep in touch with and um, I learned so much I learned so so much about business Mm -hmm. uh, because I was doing modeling all the time and I tried to always like read the perspectives I know not like all analysts have bandwidth to do that but like I was just so fascinated by all these businesses and how they were run. Mm-hmm. So I know a lot of, especially women who go into finance and they're like, you know what? I really feel like the industry is just not for me. Fashion, beauty, lifestyle, you know, jewelry is the space for me. And then they go to do an MBA. <laughs> and, um, and I suppose like the rest is history. Did you imagine that taking MBA is going to take you into that direction? Or was it a time for you to do some, I guess, maybe thinking and deciding which path was going to be forward for you? Uh, I think it was the second, it was mm-hmm. a bit of a soul searching exercise for me, because I was, you know, working so hard uh, dur- during my first like, um, section of my career four and a half years in investment making and you just don't have time to think about Mm -hmm. anything but to like look at spreadsheets and analyze things so it was a bit of a time for me to um step back but also like build something in my cv i guess Mm -hmm. doing my mba and i vaguely had this idea of um wanting to do something in fashion because that's what I loved. And when I was working in finance, I loved, you know, learning about the businesses, but I had to find my passion Mm because I just wasn't passionate about finance. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
And I did my internship. There was an MBA program at LVMH. So I did my internship at LVMH. I did a couple of projects with the brands within LVMH portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, I, I loved it. And I think I've learned a lot. But ultimately, I wanted to do my own thing. Mm. And I wanted something fast paced. Did, so did you realize you wanted to do your own thing when you were doing the MBA? Or is it something that has just been with you from way earlier it's something that's been with me for way earlier I've always been independent and I always was obsessed with business and um, even like thinking back in my undergrad there was an essay and I read back and it did talk about starting my own business in fashion mm -hmm. um, that's interesting yeah so it was always on the back of my head but mm. it was never like super tangible mm. so how did the concept for Astrid and Mew came along for you? Was it through your MBA or is it something that happened after that? So it was uh, partially like between the two because I had the choice of working for L LVMH or like going back to banking. But I really like deep inside, I really didn't want to get a quote unquote job. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to find something that I can kind of test out and, and I'm passionate about. And thinking back, in my early years, I used to travel a lot, like, you know, with my family, not just like living in different parts, mm -hmm. but also like traveling. And my fast, uh, my favorite pastime was going to market stalls or boutiques mm -hmm. with my mom and my sister and picking out jewelry. And they weren't expensive, like precious jewelry, but they always meant something. They always had a story. And I loved the warmth that I felt when I was v visiting these places. But, you know, like if you, if you go onto the high street and try to buy jewelry, it's quite cold. It's quite a cold mm -hmm. experience. And I thought, oh, there must be something where I can combine the two, where I can have like very high quality, well-branded jewelry, but in a very warm and inclusive environment. And that kind of didn't exist. And mm -hmm. if you look at the jewelry category now, I think there's a lot of exciting brands. But, but back then, 12 years ago, you saw so many cool brands in apparel, shoes and bags. And I couldn't pinpoint to a brand mm -hmm. that was accessible at this kind of price points that mm -hmm. were very fashion forward and um, brand branded. Mm. Do you think it's because jewelry was traditionally bought as a gift by men to women as opposed to women buying it for themselves? Yeah, I think so. And I think traditionally there were a lot of like local high street jewelers that are family owned and they never expanded those into a brand. Mm. And so 12 years ago, mm -hmm. wow, that's incredible. And what has been the biggest surprise for you within the business of growing it? Biggest surprise? Well, I'm surprised every day, but I think the biggest surprise is that people are everything. Mm. And that execution is so much harder and so much more important than the idea or the vision. Mm. Talk me through about a moment when you realized that that was the case? Was it something specific that happened to you that you were like, you know what, I don't know, it's like I have this brilliant idea, but things are just not working out and like how am I going to resolve that? I think it's a combination of good and bad hires. Right. Yeah, so I mean like my first ever hire is um, my CMO. I hired her 11 years ago and that's like one of the best hires I've made. Mm. How did that happen? Actually, t talk to me about that because the very early stages are so tricky because, you know, you have a great idea, you are not that well known, so convincing of people of the right caliber to join you is a really challenging thing and plus you may not necessarily have the network to be able to draw upon or have like you know benchmarking how did you find your CMO I think I was so lucky we so she worked at a very small jewelry brand at that time mm -hmm. and she was only 24 um, almost straight out of university and we had the same PR agency and we were kind of um, mending our own tables during the press days. Mm -hmm. And I thought she was the founder because she was so confident. She was kind of running the whole like stall. Mm -hmm. um, and as we were chatting, I realized that she was an employee. She it was only like two years. She, she was only two years out of university. I thought she was so smart, mm -hmm. the, the most the smartest 24 year old I've ever met. Um at that time, obviously, like I didn't, I couldn't afford her. I couldn't afford anyone. Yeah. I like it, you know, even when I hired her, I couldn't afford her. But we kept in touch. Um, and 
when the time came, when I thought like, oh, I'm processing too many customer orders and <laughs> responding to too many um, customer emails, I decided to hire as my assistant. And she basically did everything like customer services, like picking and packing. Mm -hmm. She also responded to PR requests and she was just so quick on her feet. And I guess I hired her for her potential at mm -hmm. the time. Um, and yeah, because she, she wasn't an established CMO. Yes. Right? Do you think you saw some qualities in her that perhaps you had? I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the quiet confidence. Um, she was like so capable but she, like, she's not the type who would speak out about her achievements. And I was the same when I was young, and I still am. And I could really recognize that. And I guess, mm -hmm. like, she appreciated that I recognized all of that as well. Mm -hmm. So it was, like, two-way. Mm -hmm. So that was a good hire. What about hires that not so good? I mean, like, o over the years, I've hired so many smart people, mm -hmm. um, competent people. But I think one thing I've discounted in the early years was culture fit. Mm -hmm how much they can um, sustain in a startup environment, how ad adaptable they can be mm. and how much they can grow with the business as opposed to being super con competent like at that point in time. Mm. So I think key is to hire for potential, no matter who it is, even if it's a senior hire, you need people with curiosity, humility, willing to learn, asking good questions so that they can grow with the business. Mm -hmm. um, and... I guess, like a good cultural fit, someone who's a team player, mm. I think is key for me anyways. At that point in time, did you already have a very clear idea of what your culture was or through that experience, you realized that you need to be much more clear about what? Yeah, the, the latter for sure. Yeah. I probably had a gut feeling, mm -hmm. but I couldn't articulate it. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't pinpoint it. And whenever I hired someone who I felt a bit of a grumble in my tummy it never worked out mm, that's interesting that kind of the, yeah. the gut instinct yeah mm. but I kind of wanted to go against it and think like oh like I might not like this person but this person will be great for the business but mm. you know that little thing that bothers you always becomes big and <laughs> gets amplified did you realize what that gut feeling was because I am very interested in that because mm. I think it has its pluses but it also has its downsides yeah where you know there there's obviously some kind of life experience that speaks through you mm -hmm. that, that highlights something's not quite right. Yeah. But it's important to listen to it, but also to question it. Yes, um, absolutely. Because like you, you know, I also wasn't a complete person, right? I have biases, I have my insecurities, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to project that through mm -hmm. the people. Um, and I guess like I wasn't confident enough in my gut feeling at that mm -hmm. time. But like, obviously, like you need to question yourself mm -hmm. constantly. But what's interesting is that you decided to, to hire them anyway. And what I'm trying to get to is, did you ever pinpoint? It's like, ah, oh, that's the reason yeah. why my gut was trying to yeah. tell me this. And maybe yeah. these were the red flags that I should have listened yes, to. Yes, I think it's the lack of curiosity, which could sometimes come across as confidence because people who... Um, appear to be confident and are on high, high on conviction, a lot of them end up not being curious or asking enough questions to mm. people. So it's like speaking too much and not listening enough. Yes, yeah. And I think right. I, I've kind of um, mistaken that for competence because mm -hmm. confidence is not, doesn't equate competence. No, definitely not. That's really interesting. And... Talking about, you know, we're talking about making good hires, making not so good ones, listening to your gut instinct, culture, defining that. How, through that process, you've defined what your culture is and what was the process to arrive to that? Yeah, so initially, I think it was like three, four years into the business, I had like a list of everything, laundry list of things mm -hmm. that I wanted in people so that became an initial guide which was like good to have but it was too long it wasn't punchy people could, couldn't recite it so um during covid i hired a um people consultant who used to head up um people team at sweaty betty and she was on a maternity like i guess maternity break after mm -hmm. she's had three kids and she's interviewed every single person in the business to define the culture what the key themes are so the mm -hmm. question was when do you feel best? When did you feel best at Astro Demi? Bring an example. And she interviewed every single person at that time. I think we 
had probably had 50 people, including mm-hmm. retail stores mm-hmm. at that time. And we distilled it down to three values. And it's so easy to recite. Everyone has it in their signature on email and everyone can recite it. So one is grow together. Mm-hmm. So that kind of relates to my point of curiosity. We need people who can grow with the business, who can be curious because we're growing so quickly. And if you're not growing with us, we can't keep up, but we're going to help you grow, mm-hmm. grow together and then celebrate each other. So bringing positivity Um, into the business um, and really uplifting each other and then the third is break all boundaries Mm. so that's related to innovation always questioning the status quo and always listening with like no judgment Mm -hmm. these are really beautiful how much of that income like how much of that is your own personal kind of self that brings that to 100 percent yeah 100%. Because I can't stay still. I always need to be growing. I always need to be doing something different Mm -hmm. and things very differently. Mm -hmm. How did you find the transition from, you know, being that entrepreneur, somebody who has an idea, makes that happen, to then leading a business and stepping into that sort of, you know, CEO role? So like founder to CEO. How has that transition been for you? Very painful. (laughs) (laughs) So I would say the first um, maybe five, six years I was a founder. I had a really strong core team. I had I had my current CMO, Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, who was head of marketing at that time. And then I had Shani, who's um, currently our um, international expansion director. And they've been like such a critical like part of the business, but it was kind of like I could just talk to them. I didn't need to lead them. It was just like, you know, chatting to friends. And that's very different from and they both like really grew with the business. So they were deeply ingrained. And then at one point, once we had multiples of stores, we had to have a lot of retail staff. And we had to have people that are more experienced and experts in their field that knew much more than I did and I guess that's when I felt like oh like I actually need to like step up my game Mm. I can't just be friendly or friends or just like chat to them casually I actually need to like be be a CEO but that doesn't mean like I'm appearing like you know confidently or like a big big shot it just means that I need to show up as a supporter rather than an an individual contributor because when Mm. you're a founder you're kind of dipping your toes in everything and no one tells you um off i mean like people don't like people tend to not tell like anyone off if you're in position of power but like as a founder you're kind of expected to do everything Mm -hmm. um but like as ceo you have to support the team and make sure that the right people are in the right places and it it all becomes um I guess, te- team management, mm-hmm. if you were to say, and making sure the best people are in the right positions for the strategic direction yeah. and setting the direction and being very clear about it as well and managing change along the way. With regards to being an entrepreneur, being involved in all of the areas, it's kind of what got you started, isn't it? Because you had to do it all. Mm -hmm. You didn't have the team, or if you did have a team, you know, you still had to be, you know, going to the post office every day, dropping off, you know, the parcels Mm -hmm. and so on. Was there a moment when you realized, you know what, this is actually not good for the business and I have to let go? And what was it like for you to let go of some of the things that you were still holding on to? I think it was a bit of a gradual process, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I would like to think I don't have a huge problem letting go, but it was, I think, more of an insecurity when people who were like experts came into the business. Um, I wasn't sure like whether they'd respect me um, or whether they so, sometimes like they were older than me, much more experienced than me, whether... I think I was focused on the wrong things. I thought like, oh, like what if they think like I don't have enough weight or like I don't have enough confidence or I don't look like a CEO. But um, those were probably the wrong things to worry about. The important things are how are they being supported so that we can, you know, create an amazing brand and a business. Mm -hmm. It's funny when you are a founder of, you know, this incredible brand talking about how this experience of not feeling confident enough or almost like being 
found out that you might not know something yeah. uh, how it's still there yeah I don't know whether it's a female thing I mean it's still like I still have it I think it's a human thing I think it's a necessary mm. thing because you're talking about being curious and being open and also hiring people that didn't work out because they came across as you know I know everything I'm so confident but then not having that ability to be even to question yourself like am I doing the right thing so I think this idea of you know the imposter syndrome is is actually a healthy thing to be yeah I and agree. the more you know the more knowledgeable you are the more likely you are to question yourself which means mm. that you also it's not like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. This yeah. is, is going to be the end of the world. Um, I'm not going to make a decision. But it's it's using your experience and knowledge to ask the right questions yeah, to make sure I, that I you get agree. to the right answer. Yeah. Knowing what you me. don't know is so important. You know how like yeah. my six-year-old thinks she knows everything. Because yeah. <laughs> <There's, like, laughs> she doesn't know you. the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because she's just not aware. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the, It's the awareness piece. Yeah, it's it's knowing that you don't know it. And that's why it's you are having these experts there in the first place and knowing how to lead experts. I think that is a massive shift in any entrepreneur's journey, because quite often you have founders who still want to be the ones who say, I know all of the answers yeah. and like leading in their own way where they need to take a step back in order for the business to Yeah, absolutely. And we need to approach it with curiosity. Ask a lot of questions if you don't know. Mm -hmm. And no one would think less of you because you ask questions. Mm. What was the hardest time for you in the business? I think it was 2019. <laughs> what, what year is that again? <laughs> 2019, pre-COVID. This is, yeah. um, we already had four yeah. stores and um, there, there was a particularly difficult um member of staff who's no longer with the business mm -hmm. but I, I mean I wouldn't say too much because she's like highly competent she's very successful mm -hmm. elsewhere um and I, I really liked her but I guess like the way she questioned my leadership and the way I was leading um, made me super insecure I was insecure to begin with and mm -hmm. then like these were things were being questioned so I sought out a uh, um, executive coach at that time because I was so desperate like mm -hmm. I was uh, crumbling and I had just had my second baby and I guess like I was um, drenched in hormones as well so it was probably amplified lack of, lack of sleep yeah lack uh, of sleep like everything yeah. I was like I was a mess <laughs> yeah. so I found an amazing executive coach Claire who coaches our leadership team like mm -hmm. still to date and uh, that's been super helpful. And I think that was a catalyst to me being a founder, like, mm -hmm. you know, transform, transforming sounds like grand, but like from becoming a founder to a mm -hmm. CEO founder. So you and I are similar in the sense that you've also had your kids close together mm -hmm. and a very similar age gap mm -hmm. and also pretty looks like it's pretty similar time. Yeah. So I remember for me, 2019, when our second child was born and this like having a very small child already and then having a newborn, having a business and all of that kind of combined and then followed by mm -hmm. COVID. <laughs> so that whole kind of mix of things was a lot to have on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Do you think that played a part? And I'm not leading down this like, oh, women can't handle it. You know, when they have kids, they can't run a business. But do you think that played a part or do you think something else was, was going on for you at that time? I think it was a combination of everything because mm -hmm. we, um, we had our jewelry and then we launched our piercing services in 2018 and uh, 2017. And 2018, mm -hmm. we launched our welding services and our business was just like kicking like it, that was a real turning point for the business so business was growing really quickly mm -hmm. and I had to get a lot of senior people in I hired too late at that point I think mm -hmm. um, and I was being overwhelmed I was still like doing payroll <laughs> I was still like in my bank account wow. paying invoices so I couldn't go on maternity leave and mm -hmm. I guess like I had an amazing nanny but when the kids wake up at night I need to wake up right yeah. and feed them and things like that so I think it was a combination of everything if I had mm -hmm. a normal corporate job um I mean not to undermine like a corporate job but I think it wouldn't have been as difficult though mm. I think it was just managing the business managing growth 
um, hire, trying to hire people, and trying to manage retail, which is a completely different ball game to e-commerce,、mm-hmm. and also having two kids so close in age, fourteen <laughs> months apart. No, it's like I, I think I've blocked some of it out in my、yeah. memory because it was just so difficult. Because, you know, a lot of, a lot of. Everything is just rests on your shoulders.、Mm. I think that part I found very, very challenging,、yeah. because as you said, like even in the middle of the night, like your baby wakes up and they、yeah. need you, and then you wake up in the morning, your team needs you.、Mm. <laughs> so having all of that, yeah, you know, it's it's a lot to handle. So it is a lot. Overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> so here, look at you now. <laughs> yeah. How did you do it? How did you manage like、um, the close age gap? My husband, yeah. <laughs> Basically, like my my daughter was his child, and the baby was my child. And the hardest thing was is that when our first was born, we can take turns, and when the second was born, you couldn't do that anymore. That's exactly so, the same. So what? When I had emotional and practical support, and I can like take time off and rest because we will be like a tag team with the first. With the second, that completely went out the window. Yeah. I. Would not be able to have that much of a break,、yeah. um, and so I don't. Looking back, what would I have done differently? And I think I would have taken time off, and I didn't do that.、Mm. I think I would have, or I would have created more of a support system, but not like, oh, I'm pregnant now. Let me create a support system out of thin air in the next、yeah. like nine months. But actually, think about doing that from a much Yeah. Earlier age, yeah, and I think not having a family around, like grandparents, accessible and alive,、um, that part was really hard because you had to be the adult、mm. for everything. Yeah, and I didn't feel like an adult、mm. <laughs> in many instances, <laughs> and I felt like I needed to be parented, yeah, not just to be a parent. Yeah, same.、Mm. <laughs> so I think that's that's the biggest thing I've learned. Now that they're older. That aspect is a lot. It's like it's not as anxiety-inducing and、mm. as, as challenging. Would you have done anything differently looking back? Yes, I would have hired for culture, hundred、mm-hmm. percent. Culture and values.、Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's so easy to just say to women when you ha- they're having kids. Of well, like even just my own advice, like oh, taking time off. But sometimes you don't have that luxury, no. And you just have to go through it. And I think it's a testament to how resilient and resourceful, and actually self-sacrificing women are. Yeah, and、absolutely. how much of a toll it takes.、Mm. And if you were to have more of a support system that's provided both by governments, society as a whole. You know, an adequate childcare system. You know, more of an emotional and mental kind of understanding of、mm. what it's like for a woman to go through certain phases of her life, both biologically, mentally, and physically. How impressive and successful women can just be even more、mm. supported and like. I mean, your business is t- you know taken off. Your you know very successful, but it was a difficult period of time that. Probably didn't have to be necessarily quite so hard. Yeah. So.、Um, yeah, I, I guess like one thing I, another thing I do differently is、um, when I had my first one, we were kind of winging childcare, so I、yeah. didn't have a full time professional nanny because you know how expensive that is. Yes, to、I、have. Am very so、aware. we、yeah. had like my mom、mm-hmm. come for a couple of months, like she flew from Korea,、mm-hmm. which she loved,、mm-hmm. but you know it was quite patchy, right? And we had to adjust to the different changes.、Mm-hmm. And my mother in law came for a couple of months, and we had a nanny come in three days a week, and then two days a week she was going to nursery. But like if I were to do it all over, I just like invest in a nanny. <laughs> right. Yes. So、it's, I have that consistency throughout, so I don't、mm-hmm. need to worry about that aspect. Yeah, I remember we had, we had, a part-time nanny, a nurse part-time nursery, and then we would take turns also to do the days, which worked well because if somebody was sick at any one point, there was somebody else that、mm. could kind of take over, whether it was a nursery, a nanny, or a, or a parent. But the logistics of coordinating、exactly. all of the different people, it was like being like a booking agent, and having to think about well, 
and so many weeks in advance sometimes mm. or something happening very last minute like the skills you pick up doing that <laughs> it's like it's like it's like you you just learn so many things that you just didn't even yeah absolutely realize that yeah. are I mean like helpful. having said that this is in hindsight right because I like, yes. now the business is doing well but at mm-hmm. that time I was still small like mm-hmm. I tried to I, I was trying to be resourceful yeah and childcare is like incredibly expensive but yeah yeah I remember thinking of like when having childcare if there's somebody who is taking care of my child right now that is the cost and there needs to be an ROI. That means I need to be, be extra productive and, you know, create more money. And so I wouldn't even take a rest and didn't see rest mm. as something that had like yeah. an ROI. And in hindsight, that was the biggest mistake. Yeah, self-care, like fo- not focusing on self-care. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, think that's what um, a lot of, that, that's a mistake that a lot of women make. Mm-hmm. Because I've seen the effects it has on you of you might be saving in the short term, but the effect that it has on you of stretching yourself too thin, mm. it can take years later yeah. to undo the effects yeah. of that. And also you're not as creative yeah, exactly. when you are constantly operating yeah. on overwhelm anxiety and just feeling overstretched yeah and you can't be the best version of yourself for your Mm -hmm. child either Mm -hmm. if you're stretched so on that note of self-care how do you self-care how do I self-care I try to go for a massage once a month Mm -hmm. um get my nails done every two weeks Mm -hmm. I guess those are the basic ones and like get my lash extension every month (laughs) right so you see those like those things as kind of taking time or is it focused on you know, if if I feel good, if I look good, then I kind of like feel good. Yeah, I I guess so as well. It it seems very superficial, but um, that's one aspect. And yeah, I mean, like doing personal training is Mm -hmm. one, yoga. um, I mean, I need to do more of it. It it sounds like I'm doing it all the time, but (laughs) sometimes. And reading a book, Mm -hmm. I think is quite therapeutic as well. Just take like um, putting my phone aside, although that's so difficult to do. It's so funny you say that because I've recently set myself a challenge of reading a book a week and not for the purposes of, oh, look at me, I'm so clever and I'm reading like so many books, but more about being more consistent with doing something that requires you to focus on one specific thing as opposed to just scrolling on your phone. So replacing that to some extent of being like this is I'm going to do just one thing rather than like going in so many different directions and I just love the feeling of when you are in the zone and in the flow it's just like a completely different place in your head mm. like where ideas start to take place yeah, as opposed absolutely. to like how am I going to have like a hundred different things and yeah. put them together this is a very different way the brain works yeah absolutely thinking Mm. about um speaking of creativity i used to go for walks in the park like near near our home and i'd always have like i'd always be listening to podcasts because i felt pressure to be learning something or developing and now i've i've stopped doing that and i'm just walking Mm -hmm. and just like enjoying the nature and that's been so good for me Mm -hmm. it's like trying to not have too much input Mm. and letting whatever's already in your head percolate without the need to be constantly on I think that's so underrated yeah exactly Mm. I guess that's what meditation is yes people need to be forced to meditate but like if you're you know like for 10 minutes a day just walk in nature Mm. and not think about anything that is meditation Mm -hmm. isn't it it's funny like who was saying that it's like it's now considered meditation when you go to the bathroom without your phone (laughs) (laughs) it's like that is the extent of our like technology like fueled world that that's now like the thing where you're like feeling all that thin like um but um with regards to you know going back to the business and like where do you see 
What's the future for the brand? Oh, what's the future? Good mm-hmm. question. So we're looking at international expansion at mm-hmm. the moment. So we're looking at LA, Amsterdam, Paris, and more stores in New York. But we're also trying to do things very differently. So we're opening a flagship store in August in Carnaby. Oh, amazing. So that's going to be a completely different kind of store. Mm-hmm. Right now, we our s'mores are very tiny, very efficient, but it's going to be a much bigger space where people can come and feel and live and breathe the brand. And we have a cafe space up there. And we'll have like different events all the time. So mm. that's like, I think, the next phase of the brand as well. Mm. What have you learned about retail? Because I understand that the brand started online mm-hmm. and then transitioned into, you know, more kind of in store experiences. What did you learn? about oh so much yeah. so much about people and how incredible our store managers are i mean i think store managers in general right mm-hmm. versus people who are just focusing on one area of the business because they need to deal with people mm-hmm. loads of people um ish- it, it could be rewarding but there's a lot of issues as well like naturally mm-hmm. in retail because it's quite transient and you have a lot of part-timers as well so they deal with people and they need to deal with operations right they need to deal with stock management and like all the operational things that that are going on if you know if the walls are dirty they need to sort that out if the sofa is dirty they need to sort that out Mm -hmm. and then they need to focus on like making the money so they're like mini business owners Mm -hmm. so how like incredibly smart store managers are in general Mm. you're right they're having to deal with so many different things yeah where And And every day it's different. You don't know what curveball is going to come. I feel like retail is such an underrated career choice. I Mm -hmm. feel like if you can crack and be the best store manager ever, you can go run a business. Mm. How do you think retail has changed in the the time that you've been in business? I think the brand mix on High Street have definitely changed. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of businesses, unfortunately, have gone bankrupt. And now, like, it's being replaced by, you know, some direct-to-consumer brands Mm -hmm. and some, like, new brands. So that's very exciting. And um, it looks like, you know, retailers are trying to do something different, bringing that experiential component on board. So kind of like how we have piercing tattoos and we focus so much on, Uh, amazing customer services Mm -hmm. i see a lot of brands doing that now as well which Mm -hmm. is incredible to see so it's very exciting to go do um you know go physically go go to a physical shop Mm. now so when is the carnaby store opening august august yeah amazing i need to re-pierce my ears i have not had my i've taken out my um the two piercings that i've had here since i was like the teenager for ages and I think I need to like get yeah let me know if you um want to come in because I think that the cold drops yard one is your local isn't it and when we open cold Cold drops yard king's king's cross ah yes and when we open the flagship we'll um send you an invite oh my god that's so exciting (laughs) um what do you think has been the success of Astrid and you for you like what has been like the three core things that you have done differently I think first is um, we did retail so differently before experiential retail existed. The whole vision and the inspiration behind Astrid and me was that buzzing, warm feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Which sounds a bit fluffy, but that's like really what I wanted. So, Mm -hmm. you know, getting people to come in and experience the store and obviously having these like added services are impactful as well. But I think we do retail very differently mm-hmm. and a lot of people are looking at us as a role model mm-hmm. um, for for retail, how you do physical retail. So that's been, I guess, one thing um, that I think makes Astrid Me successful. I think second is like how we treat people and how we recruit, treat people, grow people. So recently we had an all hands and we had our design agency come and present our flagship store concept. And we also had our cafe partner and like, they were like, oh, we've never seen a culture like this. Everyone looks so happy to be here. Mm. So that's something that I'm really proud of. I'm also really proud of the fact that we've put jewelry like on the map Mm -hmm. as a category because jewelry traditionally has been quite a, a very like, stale um stagnant industry but i think we've made i I think like personally think not not biased at all we think we (laughs) we put jewelry on the map and Mm -hmm. there are a lot of exciting brands popping up now Mm. who are you looking up to or thinking oh they're doing something really cool i I recently for my podcast interviewed founder varley 
Mm -hmm. I think Varley like does things really cool. They're mm -hmm. kind of a category on their own. It it's athleisure, but it's also like everyday wear, um, mm -hmm. sports wear. Mm -hmm. So I think Varley does like it really well. Looking back of when you started twelve years ago, and seeing where you've come to today, what do you think your that younger self would say to you now? Younger self, wow, you've grown a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you've done well. Mm. is it where you're expected to be i think directionally it's where i wanted to he head to mm -hmm. yeah the reality is slightly different because i always had this vision of like um you know i i always tell my husband because we both have like extremely stressful i guess kind of high powered jobs mm -hmm. so we have no margin in our lives and it was my kind of like dream to be a power couple with my husband mm -hmm. but my version of like in my head it was like us going to cocktail parties every day. <laughs> <laughs> and galas and, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> but i'm like in my pajamas like by 8 p.m <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the visuals are very different but mm -hmm. I think directionally um you know I love the fact that we're both like ambitious we're really good role models to our kids and I always wanted two girls as well so like I've got two girls so um I mean if I, if you put it that way like I think yeah wh where I am and my life is quite complete mm. I need to be more grateful mm. <laughs> are you girls into jewelry they are oh, yeah <laughs> and they love making jewelry they want to have a jewelry stall during the summer and they want to give out free lemonades with the jewelry oh. i've just remembered my mom used to make jewelry and that was like her hobby she would oh. do i even have all of the like the tools and the and the wires and the little clippers oh, and like wow. all the be like she's professional <laughs> she she was very good with her hands that she would you know she used to sew so she used to make clothes for me mm. she wasn't like that great into knitting um she loved to cook so i think this i this sort of like the craft of like occupying your hands and doing something very detailed there there is something also very meditative about that mm. so this you know the the craft of putting pieces together and what you said about you know it's something that's it's something not like clothes which can deteriorate or lose their shape or not fit you very well like jewelry sits on your skin mm -hmm. it's it holds memories it's you know it can it can fit different bodies for a long time mm -hmm. so it kind of carries through that those yeah, those exactly. memories and yeah. my mom still has energies. all of those jewelry that she's yeah. uh, accumulated over the years like in the last 40 years or so with the pieces that you you like but you don't wear what do you do with them apart from obviously just like is there a special way that you store them because i think about this i have a lot of things that you know came from from my mum and i love them but i don't feel like they they suit me or if i wear them i know i would wear them only you know once in a while mm. but, but do you think about that is that something you know that you I don't know, create like a, a way to just like look at them once in a while or... yeah. Oh, what do you I, I wish I was more intentional about them. Yeah. My mom still keeps all her jewelry. Yeah. So like when I go back home, I always look through her jewelry box because yeah. those are those bring back memories. But mm -hmm. with my pieces, I feel like I'm not as intentional. I feel like I need to do something with it. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, spark some inspiration. But I think I could just keep them aside and just wear the latest ones at the moment. Yeah. Well, I think... <laughs> I think also, you know, being in, in the business of it on, and the newness and the freshness mm -hmm. and, you know, being excited by, by new things, uh, which I am. So, you know, I, you know, all of a sudden will discover that, like this piece and I'm like, and I just want to wear it mm -hmm. all the time that I forget everything else. But then there's like this accumulation of yeah. things. Um, yeah. But I, I do love vintage pieces as mm -hmm. well, because those are the kind of pieces that my mom has, like mm -hmm. the really like big chunky yeah. stud earrings and yeah. the brooches yeah. um i love all of those i need to bring some back when i go back mm. home <laughs> what's your favorite piece oh i can't say <laughs> um, mm. like choosing your favorite yeah I, I mean i love statement earrings mm -hmm. for necklaces i like very simple pendants so i'm wearing like a birdstone necklace and i love our welded bracelets because they're so subtle mm-hmm um, and welded rings like it's like These I, are, I mean I'm not advertising yeah <laughs> no they're, they're very nice because partly I don't I love bracelets mm. and I have a lot 
But because I work so much on my laptop, yeah, that um, anything that's sort of too dangly. So yeah. I really like that because yeah, especially it's very with kids, close. right? Because you don't want anything getting in the way. So this yes. works really well because it's so seamless yeah. and it's solid gold. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, Connie, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you so much for coming on to the show. And uh, really wonderful to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Borostovsky. If you like hearing these inspiring stories of leaders from all walks of life and would like to support our show, the best thing you can do is follow and subscribe. It really does make all the difference. So we can keep bringing you these amazing guests. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next episode.